G'day guys, Tyler here in the Mets office. Today we're going to talk through our energy system characteristics. So just some of the basics that we might need to know um, and should help us have a good understanding when we come to energy system interplay later on this term. Before we get into that, we're going to just have a quick look over here at what we are actually getting from the energy systems, what, uh, how they are actually allowing us to create energy for movement. So. This set here, over here, we've got energy for movement. So every muscle contraction that we have is due to one of these, an ATP, adenosine triphosphate, splitting apart. So that adenosine triphosphate, that will split apart, which will leave us with an adenosine diphosphate, plus this phosphate molecule over here. So we can see um, if, we, if we split one phosphate molecule away, we're left with this ADP plus that inorganic phosphate. Now, when that happens, that releases energy, which we can use for movement, so that's good. What we need to do now though, effectively, is we need to recharge this. So we need to add a phosphate molecule back to this. So we recharge it to get back to this initial ATP so that it can split apart again and give us energy for movement. Our three energy systems, they work together to complete that process. So that is how we can recharge that ADP. Um, we'll talk about energy system interplay later, but how they're gonna to work together is gonna to depend on the time, the intensity, of the activity and how they'll work. So we're going to come over to this side. We've got uh, a bit of our table. So our three energy systems, our ATP PC energy system, our anaerobic glycolysis energy system, and our aerobic energy system. A few terms um, before we go through some of the characteristics. Anaerobic versus aerobic. Anaerobic, of course, meaning without oxygen. So that process is going to occur without oxygen present. Aerobic referring to with oxygen, so that's important. Glycolysis is going to refer to the breakdown of glycogen or glucose. All right, so that's pretty selfish. Matter. Anaerobic glycolysis would mean the breakdown of glycogen or glucose without oxygen in the presence. Um, all right, a few of these words up here. Yield. So when we see that term yield, we're talking about how many ATP molecules we can resynthesize per fuel molecule. So in this case, our fuel's PC. So as we break down a PC molecule, we use that PC molecule as fuel, we get 0.7. Over here with our glycolysis, we get two to three ATPs when we break down glycogen. So we'll go through those later. Rate, so we talk about rate of production. How fast do we get these ATPs resynthesized? Um, we'll go through that. Any byproducts that we get, what is the fuel source? what is gonna be the cause of fatigue associated with each, with each energy system, and then how long will they remain dominant for at a maximum intensity? That's important. Um, when we talk about how long an energy system will be dominant for, we talk about that at maximum intensity. All right, first one we're gonna look at ATP, PC. You might say ATP, CP. Phosphate creatine here, we can say PC or CP. That is the same thing. Yield. Phosphate creatine will give us the smallest yield of all of our fuel source. So we get 0.7 ATP molecules for each PC molecule that we are using as our fuel. You guys need to know less than one. 0.7 is the exact number. We need to know that that is the smallest. However, the rate of production is explosive. It's very, very, very fast, explosive, rapid. They are all good terms. We have these PC molecules stored in our muscles. They can get broken down really quick, really simple um, chemical equations. So that can happen really, really fast. That is gonna be the energy system that when we start, it can provide energy straight away, immediate, that explosive energy. Byproducts, as we looked over there, when we break down that ATP, we're gonna end up with an ADP and our, our inorganic phosphate. We don't need to worry too much about the byproducts for our ATP PC system. The fuel, as we spoke about, PC, phosphocreatine, could be CP, same thing. What's going to cause fatigue is that we are going to have a depletion of fuel. So we have very low fuel store reserves for this. At maximum intensity, it's going to be about 10 seconds, something like that, about 10 seconds of fuel stores. And when they um, run out, that ATP is going to, system is going to fatigue. So when we look at dominant period, if we are going as hard as we possibly can, we'll be able to rely on that ATP PC system to be the dominant supplier of energy for about 10 seconds, 10 to 12, something like that. All right. A second energy system, anaerobic glycolysis. These first two are both anaerobic. They don't need oxygen, that's why they can provide energy really quickly. Anaerobic glycolysis. Yield is two to three. So it is significantly more 
All right, it's still not a lot, but it's so two to three ATPs for each glycogen molecule that we break down. It can provide energy fast. It is still fast. It's not explosive, it's not rapid. We want to make sure we know that is faster. So explosive, that is fast. The problem here is that when we break down glycogen without oxygen present, we get lactic acid as a byproduct. Lactic acid being made up of lactate and hydrogen ions, and those hydrogen ions are going to cause fatigue, which we'll talk about later on in the term. The fuel is glucose or glycogen. So we have stored glucose or glycogen, we break it down anaerobically. A cause of fatigue. All you guys need to know is that an accumulation of metabolic byproducts will cause fatigue. If you can say that sentence in relation to the anaerobic glycolysis system, tick. We'll get into that in more depth later on. Uh, in terms of our dominant period, after that first 10 second period where that ATP PC was dominant, we're gonna, the anaerobic glycolysis is going to increase its contribution as those PC stores deplete. It's still fast, so still within 10 seconds we're getting really high energy from the anaerobic glycolysis system. And it is going to be able to remain dominant up to about 60. You might see anywhere from 60 to 75, depending on which textbook you're looking at. That is all fine. If you say 60, if you say 75, that is not a problem. Beyond that, our aerobic energy system. This is our preference. Our preference is to get our energy aerobically. So that means with oxygen present. The problem is it takes time. Once we start exercising, it's going to take our body time to increase our oxygen supply. So that is why it's a bit slower we get really large energy. So as we break down glucose or glycogen, we are going to get 36 to 38 ATP molecules. So much, much more than these anaerobic methods. If we were to break down fat as a fuel source, we'll get 441 ATP molecules. So that sounds really good, but um, that is very slow to do and it takes a huge amount of oxygen. So we get a, lot, a large amount of ATP for fat per fat molecule, but it takes a long, long time. Again, we'll talk about that in a few weeks when we get to energy system interplay and different fuels. In terms of that rate, it is slow to moderate. If we're breaking down glycogen, we could still say moderate. If we're breaking down fats, very slow. Make sure that we understand that it is the slowest of the three. The rate of production is the slowest of the three. This is why we like our aerobic energy system. We have three byproducts, heat, carbon dioxide, and water. We refer to these as non-fatiguing byproducts. Lactic acid is fatiguing, it will cause us to slow down. When we run out of PC, that will cause us fatigue, it will slow us down. These three are non-fatiguing. CO2 we can breathe out, water is good for us, and heat we can sweat, thermoregulate, keep that under control so we don't have any fatigue. So this is good. We keep using our aerobic energy system, we don't have any fatiguing byproducts, that's a win. We said this, the fuels we can use are glucose, or gly uh, yeah, glucose, glycogen, or fats, depending on the intensity. Some causes of fatigue from our aerobic system, fuel depletion, if we run out of glycogen and we have to rely on fats, that will mean we have to decrease our intensity, so that will cause some fatigue. An increase in core body temperature, so if our thermoregulation starts to fail in extreme conditions, if we have an increase in core body temperature, that will cause some fatigue. Dehydration, that is another one. As we increase our blood viscosity, it's harder to pump blood around the body. That will be a fatiguing factor. All these things will take quite a long time. And if we can keep on top of things like hydration, nutrition, we can, avoid, we can um, delay these, possibly avoid them. Our aerobic energy system will be dominant anything after a minute. Any event longer than a minute is going to be an aerobically dominant event. Um, all right, that's basically it. We just wanted to do some nuts and bolts today. Some questions we've seen is talking about our yield. So it's important to realize that the ATP PC has the smallest yield per molecule. And so breaking down glycogen anaerobically a bit more, breaking it down aerobically, we get a complete breakdown. So we get a lot more energy. Fats have the highest amount of ATP per molecule. Problem is, they are very slow. So in terms of the rate of production, ATP, PC, clearly the fastest. Anaerobic glycolysis is still fast, and our aerobic system is the slowest, we could say slow or moderate. Uh, we'll leave it there for today. So uh, any questions on that, shout out. Um, we're going to get into uh, a few other things later in the week. There'll be some exam multiple choice questions that relate to this stuff. We'll put those up tomorrow. Thanks for watching.